Morgan Seth Earp arrived in Tombstone, Arizona Territory in 1880. Morgan was the second youngest son of Nicholas Porter Earp, younger than Newton, James, Virgil, and Wyatt, but older than Warren Earp. In Tombstone, he joined his brothers, James, Virgil, and Wyatt, as they set out to create new lives in the silver mining town. On October the 26th, 1881, he joined his brothers Virgil and Wyatt, along with friend Doc Holliday, at a vacant lot near the corner of Fremont and 3rd Street. Morgan was there to support Virgil, the Tombstone City Marshal, in disarming a group of cowboys. What followed was one of the most famous gunfights of the Wild West, what became known as the gunfight at the O.K. Corral. Morgan was wounded in the gunfight. A bullet grazed his back that nicked both shoulder blades. Virgil and Holliday were also wounded in the shootout, but after the dust had settled, all three Earp brothers and Holliday were alive, and three of the cowboys were dead. The outlaw group known as the cowboys had been defeated that day, but they planned revenge. Later that year, on December the 28th, Virgil was ambushed on the street, with multiple double-barreled shotguns being fired at him. He survived the attack, but his left arm was permanently crippled. More months passed in Tombstone, as the Earps waited to see what the Cowboys' next move would be. On the night of March the 18th, 1882, Wyatt, Morgan, and Holliday watched a play at Shefflin Hall. After they left, Morgan was in the mood for a game of pool, so Wyatt and him went to Campbell and Hatch's Billiard Parlor. From the weekly Arizona Citizen, Tucson, Arizona, March the 26th, 1882. Death of Morgan Earp. Shortly after 11 o'clock on Saturday night, after leaving the theater, Morgan Earp, while playing a game of billiards in Campbell and Hatch's saloon in Tombstone, was shot by some unknown person from the rear of the building who fired two shots through the glass door, one of which entered the right side of Earp's abdomen below the ribs, passing completely through and shattering the spinal column. The spent bullet then entered the thigh of George B. Berry and lodged near the bone, creating a bad flesh wound. Morgan Earp was immediately removed to a lounge by his brothers and friends, and surgeons were summoned. The wound was pronounced fatal, and death ensued in a little less than an hour after the shot was fired. Of the death scene and the theory of the shooting, the Nugget says, Although he suffered great agony until he died, no word of complaint escaped his lips, which in a short time were closed and silent in death. The only words heard, excepting those whispered to his brother before he died, was when his friends attempted to raise him to his feet. He then said, Don't. I can't stand it. This is the last game of pool I'll ever play. A few minutes after the fatal shot was fired, his brothers, Virgil, James, and Warren, with the wives of the first two, were by his side. The scene at his death couch was affecting. Only a few were admitted into the room where the dying man lay. Each breath came with a gasp and a struggle as his heart yielded drop after drop of its lifeblood. Around him were those whose lives were wrapped in his very existence. But sighs, lamentations, and bitter tears could not avail or stay the last, last fleeting breath while departing from a body calm and heroic in its suffering, even as it entered the portals of death. At the front door of the saloon stood a hound, raised by the brothers, who, with that instinct peculiar to animals, seemed to know that his master had been struck down, and despite of threats or entreaties, remained whining and moaning, and when the body was taken to the hotel, no sadder heart followed than that of the faithful dog. At this hour, while the horror of the assassination is yet fresh, the air is full of rumors, speculations, and theories as to who committed the deed and how it was done. Certain it is that the shots came from pistols. The bullet holes in the door prove this, and their direction lead to the belief that one of the parties must have stood upon a barrel, either with the intention of shooting Wyatt Earp or intimidating those inside, 
and thus preventing anyone from going out and obtaining sight of the assassin. After the shots, those engaged in the affair immediately escaped through a small alley leading out to Fremont Street. But owing to the lateness of the hour and the darkness of the night, no clue could possibly be obtained. Strict search will be made today, and all that detective ability can accomplish will be done to ferret out and punish the depredators. A short time before the shooting, two men were seen standing near the door through which the shots were fired and immediately after, three men were seen running rapidly from the scene of the tragedy toward Fremont Street. From the Tombstone Weekly Epitaph, Tombstone, Arizona, March the 27th, 1882. Coroner's Inquest on the body of the late Morgan S. Earp. Spence, Stillwell, Freeze, and two Indians alleged to be implicated in the assassination. The coroner's jury, having finished its labor of investigating into the killing of Morgan S. Earp on Saturday night last, and Coroner Matthews, having filed his report of the same, with a transcript of the evidence and verdict of the jury, with the clerk of the district court, as required by law, the epitaph publishes the same in connected form for the benefit of its numerous readers and the public generally. It is seldom that a jury of investigation are enabled to bring out so strong an array of evidence upon a preliminary examination as in the present case. Unfortunately for the cause of law and order, the violent taking off of Stillwell at Tucson on Monday night has put him beyond the reach of earthly tribunals. Peter Spence has surrendered himself to the sheriff and is now in custody. His examination will come up before Judge Wallace at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Certificate of the Coroner Territory of Arizona, County of Cochise, I hereby certify that the following and annexed papers contain a transcript of the testimony submitted to a jury of inquest impaneled by me as Coroner of Cochise County, Arizona Territory, in the town of Tombstone, Arizona Territory, on March the 19th, 1882 to inquire into when, where, and by what means one Morgan S. Earp came to this death, and that the finding of said jury was that his death was caused, as they believe, from the effect of a gunshot or pistol wound on the night of March 17, 1882, by Peter Spence, Frank Stillwell, one John Doe Freeze, and an Indian called Charlie, and another Indian name unknown. H.M. Matthews, Coroner, Cochise County, Arizona Territory. Evidence in the case. Dr. G.E. Goodfellow was the first witness who was called in this case and testified to seeing Morgan S. Earp on the floor of Campbell and Hatch's saloon after he was shot. The doctor also stated as to the nature of the wound and the probable cause of death. Witness knew nothing of the circumstances which led to the wound. The wounded man lived from half to three-fourths of an hour after he arrived. Dr. W.S. Miller saw Mr. Earp before Dr. Goodfellow and corroborated all the remarks of the last named. Robert Hatch was then sworn and testified to having been at the theater on the night of the killing, that he went from there to his place of business and met Morgan Earp at the door, who said, I will play you a game of pool and they went to the back end of the billiard room and commenced to play. They played one game and started on the second. Witness had the cue in his hand, and the act of making a play was at the end of the table next to the back of the saloon. Earp was at his right and close to him with his back to the door. Just at that time, there were two gun or pistol shots almost simultaneously. Did not know at that moment where they came from, got out of range of the door. Just at that moment, witness saw Earp fall. In about eight or ten seconds, witness passed through the card room into the backyard, but could not see anyone as it was very dark. Sherman W. McMasters was present in the saloon at the time the shooting was done, saw the shooting, but did not see Earp fall, as witness dropped on the floor at the time, expecting more shots would be fired. Afterward, witness went with Mr. Holland out into the backyard, but could see no one. He stated to having his own theory as to the gang who did the shooting, but might be mistaken. 
D.G. Tipton was next called, who testified to being in the saloon, sitting near the table where Morgan was playing pool, that on hearing shots, witness ran to the front door, supposing them to have come from that way. He afterward went back and assisted in looking after Morgan. They had no trouble with anyone during the day, had been at the theater, also had been warned to look out, as some of them would catch it that night. Witness had been warned several times before, by businessmen especially. Pat Holland was in the card room at the time, sitting in a chair close to the side door leading to the passage. On hearing the shot, he ran into the passageway, but could see no one. On coming back, three men came out from the saloon armed, and fearing they might take him for one of the men who did the shooting, he went around through the Occidental. He did not think anyone could have gone down the alleyway to Fremont Street, as he did not see them, and was out, not out over eight seconds after the shooting. Isaac Isaacs was in the saloon near the stove, talking to some gentlemen, saw Earp fall immediately after the shooting, and rushed out with a crowd to see what was the matter. Marietta D. Spence, being sworn, testified as follows. Reside in Tombstone, and am the wife of Peter Spence. On last Saturday, the 18th of March, was in my house on Fremont Street. For two days my husband was not home, but in Charleston, but came home about 12 o'clock p.m. Saturday. He came with two parties, one named Freeze, a German, I don't know the other's name, but he lives in the house of Manuel Acusto. Each one had a rifle. Immediately after arriving, he sent a man to take care of the horses and take them to the house of Manuel Acusto. They then entered the front room and began to converse with Frank Stilwell. When they finished, Frank Stilwell went out and Spence went to bed. This is all that happened that night. Spence remained in bed until 9 o'clock a.m. Sunday. Freeze slept there. The other man went to his house on Friday and stayed all day, went out Friday night, but returned in a short time to sleep. Saturday he was out all day and up to 12 o'clock at night when Spence came in. There was an Indian with Stillwell called Charlie. He was armed with a pistol and a carbine. He left Saturday morning with Stillwell and came back with him at 12 o'clock at night and left about two hours after Stillwell did. Both Charlie and Stillwell were armed with pistols and carbines when they returned to the house Saturday night. The conversation between Spence and Stillwell and the others was carried on in a low tone. They appeared to be talking some secret. When they came in, I got out of bed to receive them and noticed they were excited. Why, I don't know. Stillwell came in the house about an hour before Spence and the other two. Stillwell brought me a dispatch from Spence saying he would be up from Charleston that night, Saturday, received it about 2 o'clock in the day. Think Spence left last night, the 20th, for Sonora. Don't know positively that he went. On Sunday morning, Spence told me to get breakfast about 6 o'clock, which I did, after we had a quarrel, during which he struck me and my mother, and during which he threatened to shoot me, when my mother told him he would have to shoot her too. His expression was that if I said a word about something I knew about, he would kill me, that he was going to Sonora and would leave my dead body behind him. Spence didn't tell me so, but I know he killed Morgan Earp. I think he did it, because he arrived at the house all of a tremble, and both the others who came with him. Spence's teeth were chattering when he came in. I asked if he wanted something to eat, and he said he did not. Myself and mother heard the shots, and it was a little after when Stillwell and the Indian Charlie came in, and from one half to three quarters of an hour after Spence and the other two men came. I think that Spence and the other two men, although they might have arrived during the night, had left their horses outside of town, and after the shooting, had gone and got them. I judged they had been doing wrong from the condition, white and trembling, in which they arrived. Spence and the two men had been for several days in the habit of leaving home in the middle of the day and returning in the middle of the night, but they never returned in the same condition as they did on that night. And after hearing the next morning of Earp's death, I came to the conclusion that Spence and the others had done the deed. Have not seen the Indian, Charlie, since that night. Do not know where he is. Four days ago, 
while Mother and myself were standing at Spence's house, talking with Spence and the Indian, Morgan Earp passed by when Spence nudged the Indian and said, That's him. That's him. The Indian then started down the street so as to get ahead of him and get a good look at him. Fries is a German who works for Acousto as Teamster. Think he was with Spence Saturday night and assisted in killing Earp, also Stillwell and Indian Charlie. Mrs. Francisco Castro was sworn and testified as follows. I have heard the testimony of my daughter, Mrs. Spence. It is all true. Know nothing more than what she testified, and I fully corroborate all that she has said. Briggs Goodrich On the 18th, Wyatt Earp said to me, I think they were after us last night. Do you know anything about it? I replied, No, I was not down there. He then said, Do you think we are in any danger? I said, They were liable to get it in the neck at any time. He said, I don't notice anybody particularly in town now, any of the crowd. I said, I think I see some strangers here that I think are after you. I said, By the way, John Ringo wanted me to say to you, that if any fight came up between you all, that he wanted you to understand that he would have nothing to do with it, that he was going to look out for himself, and anybody else could do the same. I think from what Frank Stilwell said, that there would be some trouble. He said there were some boys in town who would tow the mark, and the worst of it was, the Earps would think he was in it, as they did not like him. I told him I would tell them the same for him as I had for John Ringo, and he said no, that he would rather die than let them know that he cared a damn what they thought. I advised him to keep off the street of nights, and then he would be able to prove an alibi. I saw two men on Saturday night, after the theater was out, standing on the opposite corner of the street. They appeared to be watching someone. They then went up Fremont Street to 5th Street. At least one did. The other went down street. I could not recognize them. Coroner's Verdict The following is the verdict of the jury. We the undersigned, a jury impaneled by the coroner of Cochise County, Territory of Arizona, to inquire whose body is that submitted to our inspection, when, whom, and by what means he came to his death, after viewing the body and hearing such testimony as has been brought before us, find that his name was Morgan S. Earp, age about 29 years, a native of Iowa, and that he came to his death in the city of Tombstone on the 18th day of March, 1882, in the saloon of Campbell and Hatch, in said town, by reason of a gunshot or pistol wound inflicted at the hands of Pete Spence, Frank Stilwell, a party by the name of Freeze, and two Indian half-breeds, one whose name is Charlie, but the name of the other was not ascertained. Signed, J.B. McGowan, William Borland, Thomas R. Soren, E.D. Lee, W.H. Ream, Robert Upton, and P.L. Siemens. Morgan Earp died after midnight on March 19th, his brother Wyatt's birthday. Morgan was 30 years old when he died. His brother Wyatt had just turned 34. James and Virgil took Morgan's body back to his parents in California, and he was buried at Slover Mountain Cemetery near Colton, California. Wyatt and Doc Holliday stayed behind in Arizona to exact revenge on the outlaw cowboys in what became known as the Earp Vendetta Ride. Morgan's body would be moved to the Hermosa Garden Cemetery after the Slover Mountain Cemetery closed. Morgan left behind a wife, Louisa Alice Houston.